of the announcements that I've got. So who's ready for the message? There we go. Cool, cool. I'm ready because I got a message and I get to actually preach the one that I planned for, which is really awesome. It's been a few weeks since that. So Miss Annette doesn't have to scramble. She actually has notes. I want to talk to us this morning on the topic of don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember. I know it kind of sounds strange. Turn in your Bible, if you could, to Joshua chapter 24. And we're going to read a lot of scripture this morning. But I had the... um, privilege yesterday of being asked to come out to Gardens Memorial to do their Memorial Day weekend um, speech, basically asked a pastor to come and do a speech, and so I was working on that this last week, and as I was working on it and thinking about um, the, just the, re- the remembering of what people have done to sacrifice for our country, I was saying to God, what, what do you want me to say this Sunday? And basically, in a nutshell, what God said is, well, why don't you remember me? Because I think a lot of times we forget what God has done. And so I want to talk to us this morning. We're in this series, Whatever It Takes. And what I'm learning about Whatever It Takes is it's a bigger process than just saying we'll work harder. Sometimes we have to take our minds back to what God intended or what God did to allow us to move forward. So go to Joshua chapter 24, and we are going to read a lot of this chapter. So follow along with me. The uh, verse will be on the screen as well if you don't have your Bible. It says, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Noah lived, I'm sorry, and Noah lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father from Ab- uh, took your father Abraham. I left my glasses in the back, so I'm having a hard time. But I took your father. Just bear with me. I don't know where they are. I'd send someone back there. Um, Hold on. I'm going to read the screen. But I took your father from the land. It's the up close where I have the issue. I'm not getting old. I'm only 32. Okay. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac. And... (laughs) And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Sire, Sire to Esau. Man, I'm hard, having a hard time. But Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. Look at the person next to you and say, he brought you out. Then I brought your people out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan, and they fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Boer, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hands." Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites and the Perizzites. Canaanites, Hittites, Garagashites, Hivites, and Jebusites, whew, and all the botched words, ites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent a hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build and you live and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, this is Joshua talking to his people, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your an- whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, they're responding to Joshua now, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. 
It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. We'll stop there this morning. If you got your Bible, turn over to Judges chapter 2. And look at one verse, Judges chapter 2, verse 10. It says, After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. I want to talk to us this morning on the topic of don't forget to remember. And I'll talk through the story of what Joshua was talking about in Joshua chapter 24. Will you pray with me this morning? God, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would um, speak through me this morning. And let the story of Joshua come alive in our hearts and in our minds, God, so that we will be people who do not forget to remember what you have done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have you ever forgotten something really important? Like an anniversary or a birthday of someone you love? And you just feel like an idiot, right? You're like, oh, how did I miss that date? My brother-in-law has missed his mom's birthday two years in a row. I'm like, oh, bro, you got to get something good next year, right? But so many times in our lives, we we get a lot of information, right? We live in a very information-driven society. We've got these things on our pockets. We've got computers in front of us. We've got cars that talk to us now. We've got all this information being poured into us all the time. And if you're like me, with so much going in, sometimes up here in my brain... I forget some of the things. And the problem with forgetting some of the things is I usually don't forget the stupid things, right? For some reason, I can name you some random fact about nothing, but I forget about the important things in my life. I forget to do the thing that my wife asked me to do that I know would value her so much if I did it because I'd rather lay on the couch and watch TV and not do a load of laundry, right? And so I forget to do the laundry. And over in our life, over and over, there's a lot of things that we commit to, but we don't actually follow through with it. Anybody else? Sure, I'll do that. In the New Testament, uh, in the book of James, he says, let your yes be yes or your no be no, or you will be condemned. Ouch! Because I don't know about you, I'm a yes man. You want to do that? Yeah, I'll do that. You want to come over? Yeah, I'll come over there. Yes, 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 yes. I'll do anything for anybody except for the fact that I triple book myself multiple times a week because I want to do everything for everybody. And I think in our human minds, there is this problem we have with forgetting the important things, not because our hearts are wrong, but because we just forget to remember. That's what happened with the Israelites in Joshua going into the book of Judges. In Joshua 24, we just read that whole long story we read about Joshua. This is Joshua's last speech before the end of his life. Which, how cool would it be if you know you're about to die and you get to give like one final speech? My grandfather did this before he died. The problem is he did it like eight different times because he was like a cat and kept waking back up. So he kept thinking he was going to die and he'd give this big speech to the family and he'd write everybody letters and then he'd come back. And so like for, for 10 years over and over. But he finally got to give the final speech that he was excited to give our family before he died. But some people don't get that that benefit, but Joshua had the benefit of getting to share with the people he'd led his entire life right before he died, and he gathers them together, and he says, let me help you remember what God has done in your life. 
I don't know if you remember, but he brought you out of Egypt. I don't know if you remember, but, but we got up to that Red Sea and Moses stood there with his staff and, and Pharaoh's army was coming after us to kill us and, and he held that staff up and the whole sea parted. I, I don't know if you remember, but we got to that town of Jericho and God gave us those crazy instructions to march around that wall seven times and shouting and hooping and acting like a bunch of idiots and then all of a sudden the walls fell down. I, I don't know if you remember, but there were the Amorites and the Hittites and all the ites that came after us and every time God gave us victory and God gave us favor. I don't know if you remember, so I just want to tell you at this last speech that I remember, and you can choose who you're going to serve, but in my house, I'm going to serve God because I know that God has brought me out and God has brought me through, and so I am going to serve him. And, and, and Joshua's followers were like, yes, don't worry, Joshua, we got this. We're going to follow him too. We've got this. And Joshua knew his people well. He's like, y'all a little fickle, right? Because see, he remembers all the in-betweens, right? Sometimes when you, when you think of the big events in your lifetime, you think of, oh my gosh, there was that awesome time when, when God did this huge thing in my life and it was a miracle and I told everyone about it and then there was another awesome time and God did this huge miracle and I told everyone about it. But we forget that in-between time where we just lived in a place where we just hated everybody. We were like, God's never gonna do it. He hates me. He gave up on me. He just did a miracle back here. Oh, it's so horrible for me, Right? But then we get back to the glorious time, and it's amazing. And Joshua's looked like, look, I've watched you guys for years and years and years. I've seen all the good God's done. The problem with you, Israelites, is that you get to the point where you grumble. You get back to the point where you complain. You turn to other gods. You build calves. You, you worship other idols. And so God is not going to stand for that, and I know I'm leaving. And so when I leave and go into heaven, and the next leader raises up, I'm telling you, you will not be able to serve God if you keep doing what you've done over and over, because Joshua knew his people. And so they say to Joshua, no, 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 Joshua, we will serve God. And the Bible would look completely different if they had actually remembered to do what they committed to do. But two chapters over, in Judges chapter 2, where we read the verse that says, After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. In one generation... The people who were over here yelling, we're going to follow him, we're following God, our house will follow God, we got this, is over here and one generation later, they don't even know about God. I don't know about you, but that kind of scares me. That kind of makes me go, there's a responsibility on my life to tell the next generation behind me about the goodness of God. There's a responsibility on my life to not forget what God has done because if I forget what God has done and I don't share what God has done in my life, then I don't know if the generation coming after me and my 23-month-old in that nursery downstairs will ever fully know what God has done if I forget to remember And over and over throughout the word of God, if you read these stories, it's stories of people encountering God in big ways and seeing amazing things and then forgetting the very next day who God was. The Israelites are in the wilderness and they're thanking God for provision and he's providing them food and he's giving them all this stuff. And then one day they just start grumbling and they're like, God, we have nothing to eat. And so God starts sending manna from heaven. Anybody ever had manna come from heaven? I don't know if you ever had Great Harvest Bread Company, but that's what I imagine manna to be. 1,400 calorie pieces of bread. Oh, manna. Like, that's that's heaven. A little Philadelphia cream cheese on there. Oh, beautiful. But manna comes down from heaven. And and a year later, not not how long how much long long, long later, I can't talk. A, A chapter later, the same people that got manna from heaven are grumbling again. God, you don't provide for us. We don't get anything. Hello, it's raining bread. For a carb addict, I mean, there's nothing better than that. Like, raining bread all over you, you're like, ah, you don't provide for me, God, because I need some steak. Right? 
And how many times in our lives do we not remember what God has done and the goodness of God because we try to convince ourselves he's actually not doing it or he's not giving us what we think we want. And so instead of celebrating to the next generation and telling them about the goodness of God, we just start to grumble and complain. And in our grumbling, we forget to remember what God has done. Have you forgot to remember? I was reading some statistics a few weeks ago and I was sharing with the leaders in our church how much it scares me. Because when I was a kid, I was born in 1985 and I know to some of you that I'm a youngin, but to some of you I'm like old. Hanging out with our interns this week, we were on our intern retreat. I felt so old. Like these 19, 20, 21, I think I'm still that age. I, I, and then I, Alex has so much energy. I'm not. I'm old. This is, I mean, I'm not old, but like, you know what I mean? I'm like, man, I, I guess I'm like, I'm like 12 years removed, 13 years older than you. That's crazy because I think I'm still in college, which is probably why I still eat like I am. And so, oh, oh Applebee's. Okay, anyways, uh, I got sidetracked again. But, 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 I, but hanging out with these, these young people, it's a whole different generation than even my generation. And for some of you in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you're going, I don't even understand the world that we live in. But imagine being the 2-year-old or 12-year-old or 20-year-old right now, and they don't really know what's going on in the church and what's going on in the kingdom of God because we're not telling them. And statistics show right now that only 4% of millennials claim to be Christians. I am the beginning of the millennial. I'm probably end of Generation X, beginning of millennial. I'm right in there. My mindset's a little more Generation X probably. Um, but when I was born, I looked at the stats in the, in the 80s, 86% of that generation claimed to be Christians, and now 4% of millennials. I look at that, and I'm not like, oh, man, that's just too bad. I'm like, oh, oh, that is my fault. That is our fault corporately as the church. And I think the reason that our societies come to this place where people don't even know about God is because we haven't told them. We've manufactured a Christianity that says you got to have more lights and you got to have more smoke and you got to make it more fun and it's got to be this big production and they're not buying it. They're like, y'all are fake because no one's life is that exciting. No, I don't know about you, but I don't drive around with music in the background and smoke in my car when something good happens. It'd be so cool if I could, right? But that's not life. That's not reality. And they're seeing through it and they're going, I don't think I want what you have. And as a pastor, I read that stat and I was like, whoa, what happened? I think what happened is we forgot to remember. I think what happened is we stopped sharing our stories because we don't want to offend people or we don't want to tell people that Jesus is the only way because that's not trendy and we don't want to talk about it because then it might not make people feel real good. And the problem is we are feeling people real good into hell. Whoa. Right? We are not telling people about the gospel of Christ because we're so afraid that they won't get it or we don't understand them or whatever, and we're not allowing people to encounter the living Jesus of the universe that my parents encountered and changed my life. My parents were alcoholics and drug addicts. My parents were far from God, and some guy in a GM plant in Michigan talked to my dad about a Bible and my dad went from the bar on Wednesday night to a Bible study on Thursday night and got radically saved and all those addictions were broke and I stand here today on the shoulders of a man who just got out of his way at GM and said you know what I might be at work but I'm going to grab my Bible and I'm going to tell this guy about him and 32 years later his son's going to run a ministry because I stand on his shoulders because he loved, because he loved my dad enough to say, dude, I don't care about all the stuff. Smoke what you want to smoke, drink, what you, that's not about it. I want you to know the living God of the universe. So what's happened that we've gotten to a point where we're no longer telling people about it? And we could say, well, well, I don't know if that's really true. Well, I don't know if it's true isn't even an excuse anymore. Because statistics are showing that it is. 4% of the generation coming up behind us doesn't know. You look at church budgets, the lowest budget in the church is a kid's ministry. Right? I was talking to Erica about that this week. Our kid's ministry should be where we pour in money. 
We're pouring money into the school in Africa not so we can say, look at the cool building we built. No, because there's a generation of kids who are going to grow up to be presidents in Africa. And if we don't go after them, they'll never know about the goodness of God and what he's done. What have we forgotten to share? If we were to go around this room this morning and everyone share the good things God has done in your life, I bet we could be so excited by the time we left here. I was sitting down here this morning, kneeling down during worship, and it was one of those moments where I was just thanking God for how good he is because I'm in a season right now where God's just been real good. He's just been good. A year ago, I was not in that season, all right? I I, I was laying on this altar, crying my eyes out, saying, God, I don't know how this is going to work and all this, and God's began to turn some things around in my life, and I'm like, man, God's been good. But you know what I tend to do is I get up here and I share with you all the struggle stories, but I don't share the good stories. Because I don't want you to feel like, oh no, he's, things are good for him and it's not for me and that's just not reality. No, if I tell you the good that God has done for me, you can begin to see what God could do for you. And we all go up and down through life, but what if we began to tell people about the goodness of what God has done? If you're taking notes this morning, one thing you can write down is that we remember by recalling the good things that God has done. In Psalm chapter 77, David writes and he says, I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. When's the last time you just sat down and wrote out the good things that God's done in your life? Just got a journal and just said, man, God, thank you for providing for that need. Thank you for providing for that thing I didn't think would happen. Thank you that I have air to breathe. Thank you I've got food to eat. Thank you I'm able to give out of my overflow. Like all these things that we do naturally, you come come in here each week and it doesn't matter if you've got two pennies or $2,000 and you throw it in the bucket, you're able to do that because of God's blessing on your life. When's the last time we looked at it like that instead of like, oh, I gotta give my money. No, I get to because God's blessed me in such a way that I get to bless others as well. When's the last time we just started recalling what God has done for us? Because when I sit around and think about it, I look at my life and I go, how in the world am I the age I am and able to see the things I've been able to see? It doesn't make sense. This week, I was up in Michigan, and I've shared with you guys some stories of, of some of the hard times through the last year and having to close down a church that we started, and it was grueling, and it was not fun, and it's not things that I want to remember, honestly, except that you can learn from your failures to move forward, which is a whole other message. But, but, but I, was, I was up there, and we took the interns, and we showed them all the different spaces that we have Center for Successes, and it was kind of surreal for me because three years ago, it was just an idea. And now we're in five different cities up in Michigan. It doesn't make sense, but it's the goodness of God bringing people together, bringing people that want to fund it, bringing people that want to mentor kids, bringing directors together. And now there's this network that's impacting the next generation. And I look at it and and I'm like, well, I don't want to tell people because I don't want to sound braggy. It's not about bragging on me. I didn't do anything. I just signed the checks. You know what I mean? I just worked with a lawyer on the 501c3 paperwork, all that jazz, which is so fun. But like, You know what I mean? It's God bringing people together and in the process of things in my life that felt like they were bad and falling apart, he was still increasing this other part of my life. But I tend not to share that because I don't want to just focus on the good. It's easier to tell God what I don't have. But God, last year was really hard. He's like, yeah, it might have been. But you also were able to do this and, and see more centers open and see more kids educated. You also were go to, able to go to Africa and start a school. Hello. You also were able to plant two more churches in Africa last year. That's what we were able to do. And I focused so much of my time and effort and energy that what I talked about was what was going wrong instead of the good things that God was doing. And now I don't know why the next generation can't remember how good he is. What do you need to recall about what God has done in your life. The next thing to write down is that we remember by proclaiming God's love to the next generation. Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, and he says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 
The only way the next generation will ever know about God's love and the saving grace of Jesus Christ is if we tell them. And how can they hear it unless we preach to them? And how can we preach unless we're sent? The word sent, I think, scares some of us because we think, well, it's not my job to tell people about Jesus, right? It's not my job to, to, to share Jesus with the world. That's the pastor's job because he was sent and he was ordained and he went and took Bible classes and learned all that stuff. And so that's his job. My job is just to show up. But I think we've talked enough this year about our job as the Great Commission and our big job together, our, our BHAG. Our BHAG. You know what a BHAG is? Big, hairy, audacious goal. BHAG. I just taught you a leadership concept that we paid a consultant a lot of money to sh- share with us at the Center for Success Network. BHAG goal, all right? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Our BHAG is the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It doesn't say to raise up pastors who will go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's on us as the church. You don't need a platform to preach the gospel. You have relationships every day. You sit around lunch tables. You sit in your work environments. You sit with your families. So how are you proclaiming God's love to those around you? You have been sent if you are a disciple of Christ. You have been sent if you've given your life to Jesus. So now my question is, where are you going? And what are you doing with your life? Because guys, this life is too short to just focus on here and now. It's too short. I've buried too many people this year. It's not fun. This life is too short to just think about getting the next house and the next car, to getting the next degree and all the stuff that we pursue. And I don't think that stuff is inherently wrong, but I struggle in all of it every time. I do. I struggle. I lease my car and my lease is getting ready to come up. And so I'm looking for another car. And every time I'm looking for this car, I feel this like, I don't want to feel this guilt, but I'm like, God, why does it matter like what I drive? And I'm spending time on what I drive and not spending time on driving your kingdom forward right? Like, and I'm not saying, get a, get a nice car. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is I think we spend so much time on the here and now and never on the there and then. And the problem is before we know it, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we're gone. And everything we built is for what? If it wasn't built to reach the next generation for Christ, how are you proclaiming his love as a sent person from God. The last one to write down this morning is that we remember by living our life for the sake of the gospel. Joshua said, you can choose who you want to serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What does living your life for the sake of the gospel look like? What is it look like for you because it may not look the same for me. All around this room, we all have different kinds of callings. Not everyone is called to be in ministry. Not everyone is called to have a microphone, but every single one of us is called to live our life for the sake of the gospel in every single thing that we do. And so if you look at your life this morning and you think, okay, I want to be one of those whatever it takes kind of Christians. I want to be one of those people that will do whatever it takes to build the kingdom of God. Or we started this series at the beginning of May. I want to be one of the people who says, I will do it. Then my question for you on this last week of May is, are you living your life in a whatever it takes for the gospel kind of way? If the majority of the time you spend is not thinking about how you can impact and reach the world for Christ, then I would argue you're probably not. If the time you spend is so much dwelling on what you can do and how you can be successful and how you can get to the next place, and I'm preaching to myself this morning because I may act like I'm a good pastor when I'm up here, but I'm just very much white privilege kid like a lot of people. Can I be real? I sit around thinking about how I can advance and how I can do this and what's the next way I can figure out this. And look, that thing's 0%, so it must be a sign from God, right? I do it too. And then I look at my life and I zoom way out and I go, man, I'm 32 years old, so at best, my life is a third over. And those 32 years went by really, really fast. 
And if I am so fortunate to live to 96, I do not want the next 64 years to be spent only thinking about what I can do here. I believe in the blessing of God. I believe God wants to bless us. I believe in what the Bible says about tithing and that if you give, it'll be given unto you. I've lived it out. I could tell you story after story, but I don't need to stand up here and tell you stories of the goodness of God about money because that doesn't, it happens to some people and doesn't for others. If it's not relevant in Africa, guys, it's not relevant here. I know people who've given buttons off their shirts, but they're still not prospering. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm just going there, okay? Okay. It's quiet here, that's okay. Because here's the thing. If we want to live our life in such a way that we live for the sake of the gospel, the gospel calls us to give everything. And that's not easy. It's not easy. It calls us to give time. It has literally driven me to counseling at times because I was so spent. And I don't recommend spending yourself so you are are dying. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that you should be so sold out to building the kingdom of God and reaching the next generation that you will do whatever it takes to live your life for the sake of the gospel. And it doesn't sound easy. That's because it's not. It's not easy. It's not easy. I'd love to get up here. I wasn't even planning to say this stuff. There's no notes here, just this couple little points. But I'd love to get up here and just tell you how to live an easy Christian life. The word works. I mean, you can if you want. But I don't want to just live an easy Christian life that watches people around me die and go to hell. I don't want that anymore. There's a time I probably did, if I'm being really real, because I'd rather be successful. (laughs) That's your problem, you know what I mean? But I feel like I'm in that place where that old song says, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. And though none go with me, still I will follow. And though people think I'm crazy, I'm still going to go. And though people make fun of me, I'm still going to do it. I'm not going to act weird. I'm not going to be the guy that puts bumper stickers all over my car and, and then honks at people and gives them the finger, but I love Jesus. And I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that, but I'm saying in every way that I live my life, am I sitting at a restaurant talking to a friend saying, hey, can I tell you what God has done for my life and how he could do it for you? Or am I too ashamed because I don't want them to be offended? And in the process of not offending them, I'm forgetting to remember what God has done for me and now allowing them to watch him do it for them. Will you live your life for the sake of the gospel? I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes all over this room. This is one of those messages that I think is more of an interpersonal response than an external. Because I don't know where you have or haven't lived that way. I don't get to see all of your lives every day of the week. I see you here on Sunday and some weeks these lights are so bright I can't actually see you. I'm just acting like I see you. But it's okay. But I want you to take a few minutes to just ask God where you could live more for the sake of the gospel. Because I don't want to get to the end of my life, and I don't want to get to the end of the life of this church and look back and say, well, we we cared about kids. We put them down in that basement that smells musty and doesn't have air conditioning, but they're okay because we're comfortable up here. And, and, And we don't really have budgets to help support the kids down there, so the kids workers just keep giving and giving and giving, but we'll, we'll get what we need. No, I want to be a church that says, look, like we need repairs, yes, for the whole building, but we also need to be building as much as we can into our kids because that's the next generation and that's what matters. And so my question for us this morning is, where in your life are you not living for the sake of the gospel and how then can you do it in greater ways? I know this is not a happy, clappy, leave church, soaring kind of message. But I want you to know that this is something that is so on my heart lately. Because as your pastor, I have to stand before God for what I taught you. And if I only teach you the seven steps to prosperity and how to be happy, then I'm missing something. Because Jesus did not say, come and follow me and you will get a mansion. 
He said, come and follow me and take up your cross and follow me. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that he says that we can cast all of our cares on him. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when we bring it to Jesus, it doesn't have to be a treacherous life. I, 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 don't hope, I hope you don't see this morning that what I'm trying to say to us is we should walk around negative and depressed and feel like we're burnt out. I love my life. You can ask anyone in my inner circle. I absolutely love my life. I forget to sleep sometimes. I love my life so much. My question for us is not how can we give up our life in such a way that we're just walking around like manic, depressed people, but how do we give our lives up so much for the gospel that we find so much joy in Christ and joy in doing what he calls us to do that we get to stop and remember all that he's done and continue to share it with others. So with every head bowed and every eye closed around this room, let us ask you a simple question. Will you live your life for the sake of the gospel, not forgetting what God did for you, but in such a way that you will tell others about him? If that's you this morning, would you just lift your hands so I can pray for you? Awesome. Thank you, guys. So, Father, this morning, there's hands all over this room. I pray for every single person with a lifted hand. Lord, first off, I just say on a personal level, Note that I ask that you'd forgive me for the times where I have forgotten what you've done, where I've dwelled more on what I'm lacking than on what you've provided for my life, where I've watched manna fall around me, but I complain because I want steak. Would you forgive me, God, for the times that I've spent more time trying to invest my money than to invest in your kingdom? Would you forgive me for the times that I've thought more about what I drive instead of how to drive your kingdom forward, God? I thank you for your provision. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for the times that you've done things, even monetarily, for Kelsey and I and for this church, God. But I pray that our eyes would not be on stuff, but that our eyes would be on how we can build your kingdom, God. That our eyes would be on how we can provide for the least of these. How we can build more schools and plant more churches in Africa, God. How we can plant more churches here in the U.S. and how we can start more Center for Successes and how we can start more ministries to the poor and ministries to the, to the unnamed and the unwanted and to the people who live in places where they don't deserve to live and to the prisons, God, and to the, to, to the, to the shelters and wherever you're calling us to, God. Would you give us the dreams and the visions to go and build your kingdom? And would you give us the strength, God, to live in such a way as to say, I have decided to follow Jesus, and I don't care who's going with me, and I don't care if they support me, and I don't care what they say. There is no turning back. And if no one comes, still I will follow because I remember what you did for me. And I will live the rest of my life telling of what you did for me, saving my soul, saving my family's soul, setting my parents free from addictions and, and things that, that I've never had to experience because you did a work in their life, God. Would you let us live in such a way that says no matter what else is going on in my life, no matter where I still need breakthrough, no matter where I still need to see you do things in my life, I have decided to follow Jesus and I am going to plow forward until I see his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I will not turn back, but I'll do whatever it takes to remember to live a life of giving myself up for the sake of the gospel. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Will you stand with me this morning? Thank you guys for being here this morning. Just want to challenge you. There was a ton of hands. You know why I love this church? Well, there's a lot of reasons I love this church, but you guys are so responsive. I've never worked with a group of people, honestly, that so much wants what God wants. So thank you for that. And thank you for being a church that says we're not going to turn back. And let's go and make a difference in our community. If it's your first time here this morning, we would love to see you back at our Connect Desk and hear more about our church. Also, if you want to become a partner, you can meet us back in the cafe. If you need prayer for anything in your life, our prayer partners will be down here in front. They would love to pray with you about anything in your life. Or maybe you want to make a commitment to following Jesus for the first time or the millionth time. It doesn't matter. Come pray with one of them. And then before we go... Let's confess the blessing over ourselves and our week. And I truly believe this because that's building God's kingdom.
Our best days ahead is seeing God's kingdom built here on earth. So let's say this together that my best and most blessed days are ahead of me. Love you guys. Hope to see you back next week.